fast foods are not just the foods we purchase in a fast food restaurant, but they're also foods, processed foods, fake foods, I call them Franken foods, you know, potato chips, candy, cookies, rice cakes, you know, breakfast bars, whatever, all this processed foods people are eating, they're predominantly calories with no significant load of micronutrients. And by micronutrients, I don't just mean vitamins and minerals, I also mean those phytochemicals and antioxidants that our brain and our body needs for normal cellular function and normal immune system. Food is supposed to contain a rich source of nutrients and our brain and our brain cells need a constant and continual supply of phytochemicals to keep healthy. We don't supply these antioxidants and phytochemicals, we age rapidly. We lose brain function. And over the years, we become demented. And it also makes us at a higher prone for depression and mental illness if we're taking in these processed foods. So these processed foods aren't just void of nutrients, they also contain toxins and chemicals, food additives, flavorings, food colorings. And our body, when we take in food with no nutrient supply, we produce metabolic wastes from our own body. So we have a combination of waste products, lack of nutrients, and also, because the calories rush into the bloodstream all at once, so many calories, it signals dopamine receptors in the brain. And we become, over time, we become dopamine insensitive. The point I'm making right now is that these concentrated calories, we call them highly palatable, you know, fast foods and processed foods, are addicting. They affect brain receptors in the same way that opiates do and cocaine does. And so people become addicted to it, which means they get a high when they consume it, they get some pleasure when they consume it, they try to stop consuming it and stop eating it, they feel discomfort. They feel shaky and weak and fatigued and headachey. They constantly have to overeat calories. And right now we have a po human population in America where like 90% of our population is overweight or obese. I know conventional authorities say it's uh, two thirds of Americans are overweight or obese, but that's because they use a BMI of 25 as a demarcation line. And in reality, all long-lived people in healthy societies all have BMIs below 23, not below 25. If we use 23 as a demarcation line, then it's about 90% of Americans are overweight. It's only about 2 to 2.5% two of Americans that actually are normal weight because they live and eat healthy. The other people may be a normal weight because they're sickly, or alcoholics, or smoke cigarettes, or have autoimmune conditions, or, have, or, or depressed, or have you know, or cold cancers, or, or in other words, smoking alone it makes you thinner. It doesn't mean you're good to be. So we take the smokers away and we have even less. So the point is, is very few Americans are really living healthfully. And, we, and because of that, we have a health care crisis of unprecedented proportion, more overweight, more sickly people than ever before in any, of any society in human history. And it's, tr it's tremendously tragic and needless. Being overweight or obese is not just a cosmetic issue. It's a very serious condition. Because when you're overweight, your body, it makes your body insulin resistant, which means now when your pancreas produces insulin in response to what you ate, oatmeal, a mango, whatever it is you eat, eat, it's gonna produce three to 10 times as much insulin. It needs to overwork itself just to function normally. So an insulin itself promotes cancer. It's a hormone, it's a fat storage hormone, and it's pro-angiogenesis. In other words, angiogenesis means the promote the most of group, new blood vessels. For fat to grow on the body, they secrete angiogenesis promoting hormones, and insulin promotes that further to allow new blood vessels to grow to fuel the fat with oxygen, with glucose, with sugar, with nourishment, making the fat grow. In doing so, it allows, and it promotes cellular replication, allows other cells to grow. When we're no longer growing, we're just growing outward, and insulin promotes that growth. It promotes the growth of cancer. It promotes the growth of atherosclerosis. It ages your body. And when you're overweight, you have high circulating insulins all the time, shortening your lifespan. Also, fat cells produce more estrogen, and higher levels of estrogen are linked to breast cancer and prostate cancer. So even being moderately overweight is a health risk. There's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. If you're overweight, you are not at your optimal health. You have to be at your optimal weight to have optimal health. So we're talking here that the American diet is so addicting that it keeps people overweight. They constantly want more food than they require. But when you eat healthy food, when you flood your body with high nutrient foods, that's the secret, you know, the secret sauce, so to speak, because that's what you, how it curtails your appetite. I published a study in 2012 with over 750 people 
and we showed that as we ratcheted up the nutritional quality of the diet and people took in more natural foods that were nutrient rich, their appetite went down. The desire for calories went down. The secret here is when your body is healthier, cleaner, fueled with phytochemicals and antioxidants, you're not going to detoxify and feel so weak and fatigued and having to use food as a stimulant as much. So people fail on diets because they try to cut back on calories willy-nilly without improving the nutritional quality of what they're eating. You have to do both. And we have to motivate and educate our population to recognize how critical is this message is because people are becoming depressed because of what the food they're eating. They're getting mentally ill. We have one in five Americans now mentally ill. And people who are diabetic or overweight are at higher risk of developing depression and higher risk of developing anger and violence and even criminal behavior because it's affecting their brains so negatively. The leading cause of death in the United States is cardiovascular disease, meaning heart attacks and strokes. Heart attacks and strokes affect almost 40% of all Americans. It's ever the more so tragic because it's a needless, because they're all needless deaths. Nobody has to have a heart attack or a stroke. There's even areas of the world today where people, where you can look at studies done on people where they've had no heart attacks and strokes, like the Katawa Island study where those people have no heart disease, no high blood pressure, and their ancestors had no heart disease and high blood pressure. This is a, a disease that's the result of um, nutritional ignorance. So we're dying of the diseases of our knife and fork. It's, it's not only does nutritional excellence prevent heart attacks and strokes and dementia, but it reverses it. In other words, most Americans think their answer to having high blood pressure and high cholesterol is going to their physicians and getting cholesterol-lowering drugs and blood pressure medications, which maybe lowers your risk of heart disease by about 10%. But if you want to lower your risk by 99%, change your diet. Dietary excellence is 100 times more effective at preventing future events like heart attacks and strokes than is medication. The medications function as a permission slip. They give people the false sense of security to think that they're going to be protected. And they can just keep eating the food that caused the damage to begin with. They get heavier. Their atherosclerosis continues to advance. And the inevitable consequence is they suffer and die from heart disease needlessly as a result of conventional medical care which never addressed the cause of disease. This is a dietary-induced disease, and the solution is dietary, not medical. Well, talking about the dangers of fast food, there's so many different dangerous ingredients and carcinogens in fast food, but what people don't recognize that one of the most dangerous ingredients is just eating fried foods. Because when you take potatoes and you fry them in oil, especially in a fast food restaurant, where they're cooking that oil for hours, heating it up, that oil you know, becomes rancid. That oil oxidizes. That oil has, is now a carcinogen, a mutagen, a teratogen, which means it doesn't just cause cancer. It can change your DNA to cause birth defects in your offspring. We're talking about heated oil being so carcinogenic that even one serving of commercial french fries a week, just one serving a week is linked to a 26% increased risk of breast cancer. You know, even Working in a fast food restaurant, just inhaling the fumes from those, you know, those oil frying vats can, it can cause disease. So it's a serious issue. So we're talking about that the World Health Organization has declared processed meats, barbecue, grilled meats, have fried foods as a class one carcinogen. In other words, these foods are not, class one carcinogen is the same category as asbestos and cigarette smoking. These aren't suspected carcinogens, they're definitive carcinogens. To eat them, you have to be insane. You have to be insane to eat these foods. They're so dangerous. They're even, even moderate use can cause cancer. But the problem is, is that when you do eat them, it makes you insane. It makes you addicted, and you lose your intelligence. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that these carcinogenic foods don't just create cancer and heart disease. They also destroy brain cells. In doing so, they make people less intelligent, less ability to concentrate, Increased risk of depression and mental illness. So we're talking here about the sweets, the ice cream, the sugar, the fried foods, the grilled and processed meats, all form this umbrella of damage in the body. Now, it doesn't just damage you peripherally. It doesn't just damage your heart and your lungs and your kidney and your blood vessels. It damages your brain. It puts a fog over your mental function. So you're no longer creative. You no longer can come to solutions. And then people think they're all stressed out. And they have to eat these foods to, re to reduce their stress. 
and they don't understand that the food itself, that the addiction is what creates the stress to begin with. It takes away their ability to fully come to creative solutions in their life and to, and to solve the problems that they face in life. The food and the addiction is the problem. It doesn't make, the addic it doesn't make your stress less. It, continuing the addiction makes your stress worse keeps you in a vicious cycle of pain and sorrow and tragedy your whole life. The key is to get rid of your addiction, to stop cigarette smoking, to stop being an alcoholic, to stop snorting cocaine, to stop eating fast food and junk food and sweets and processed foods and fried foods. It's the only way to have a quality, and a ha a quality li a life, quality of life in your later years with your full mental faculties intact. And your only chance to really have a happy golden years People live their whole life. They work like a dog their whole life. And they, you know, imbibe in their pleasures and they live for the stimulation and they get to the point where they can work less and their brain is shot and their body is shot and they're, they're now they're addicted to the medical profession, going back and forth to hospitals and doctor's offices and taking pills and side effects and going into being in emergency rooms and in hospital, you know, and they spend their whole life and then, and then, then maybe even in, in nursing homes. They've worked their whole life and finally they get to the point in life where they can enjoy their lives, where they should be in great health and being vibrant and having a great happy life because now maybe they're financially more secure and now they, now they have all these medical problems troubling their life. It's, it's ridiculous. The human body is designed to, to, to live, easily live between 95 and 105 years in most cases. The bell curve, the bell curve should narrow in when you're eating a healthy diet. By, by the bell curve narrowing in, I mean that the average age of death is like 78 or so it was a wide bell, which means some may live to be 90 and some die at 60. A wide bell, you don't know what the hell is going to happen to you. It's just like throwing up a, the dice. You're going to be dead soon? You're going to be stuck with, a, with half your body not functioning and a nursing over the next 10 years? You're going to be demented and have, you know, you're going to be dependent on your family to have to, have to take care of you? And so you don't know what's going to happen to people. But when you eat a healthy diet, no matter what your genetics, the curve narrows. And even the people with weak genetics live to be in, live to be in their mid-90s. And people with strong genetics may live over 100. But the point is the curve narrows and you don't see the dependency and the weakness and the loss of quality of life between 60 and 90 years old. You see people enjoying their lives with their full mental and physical capacity without being in pain and being you know, you know, stressed out by medical conditions and medical problems. And then you're eating the American diet and then you die or you get sickly and you get very sick and eventually you die. And you die in a hospital. Then they you die under medical care, I should say that you die under medical torture. Because you're going to die anyway, but you've got to be in a hospital and be prodded and pricked and, and try to get an extra year or week out of life. So instead of being died peacefully at home with your loved ones around you, you've got to rush to the hospital in an ambulance so they can torture you for a week or two to keep you alive, so, they can take all your, so your money can be gone, your house can be gone, and all your savings your whole life can go to, the, can go to this, um, these, these um, you know, exhaustive and almost impossible efforts to keep you alive an extra day or two in a hospital ICU and torture you in the process. You know, it's just... It, the whole system is insane. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying when you eat unhealthy, you become a food addict. Because unhealthy food is addicting, and you can't control your appetite anymore. The only way to lose weight permanently and keep it a healthy weight the rest of your life is by eating a healthy diet. You can't cut back on calories when you're eating unhealthfully. Because you, you can't tolerate cutting back on calories. You feel too ill if you try to. The point is is that these foods are highly addicting. When calories rush into the bloodstream so rapidly, it's not natural. When you eat beans, you're getting glucose, carbohydrates into the bloodstream, but it comes at about one calorie per minute. You're eating sugar and honey and maple syrup and fast food and ice cream and all this crap, people, donuts and cookies and croissants, and the calories are rushing at like 50 calories a minute. Your body's not designed to accept 50 calories a minute. That's a drug. That's like taking, that's snorting cocaine. That's injecting heroin 50 calories a minute. And you have unfavorable hormones that result as a, re, that occur as a result of that. And these hormones that, that so insulin's a hormone, estrogen's a hormone, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one is a hormone. And we know that excessive circulating hormones promotes cancer, promotes aging, promotes loss of mental clarity, the point I'm making right now is that the only thing ever been proven in the history of science to radically extend the lifespan of animals, insects, worms, fruit flies, you know, rodents, primates, baboons and chimpanzees and humans, 
all species of animals. The same thing's been shown to increase lifespan in all species of animals and insects, and that is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. That is, taking in somewhat less calories, but supplying the optimal amount of nutrients that don't contain calories, of course, micronutrients do not contain calories, the optimal amount of nutrients we, that humans require. And the only way you can do that to, to extend human lifespan and slow the aging process, the only fountain of youth is to eat more foods that are nutrient rich and naturally contain these undiscovered nutrients that are in vegetables most, and fruits and beans and nuts and onions and mushrooms, undiscovered nutrients, and less foods that are man-made or processed where the nutrients are stripped out of them. We have to get back to nature. We have to get back to growing our own food, eating foods in the woods, eating foods grown on good soils, on biological soils, with a few insects and bacteria. So we're so divorced from nature that our bodies don't function normally anymore. But the thing is, is that nutritional science has made such advances in the last 20 years that we can give people information to protect themselves that's so critical. Like, for example, if you want to build up and thicken the biofilm, the bacteria that line the villi in the small intestines, with healthy bacteria, that prevents inflammation, helps you lose weight. Because these, this biofilm of healthy bacteria slows the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream. I was just talking a minute ago how the rapid rush of glucose into the bloodstream acts like a drug. But when you eat a mango or oatmeal, they, have, they produce glucose into the bloodstream, but it doesn't come in as fast as when you had ice cream or white bread. But the thing is, when you thicken your biofilm, even the mango and the oatmeal now come in much slower. And the foods that, and there are four secret foods that thicken the biofilm, two raw foods and two cooked foods. The two raw foods that thicken the biofilm are raw green vegetables, especially raw cruciferous vegetables like kale and cabbage and broccoli and you know, bok choy and watercress and arugula, and raw onion or scallion. Those two foods, you have a salad with raw vegetables, with raw greens and onions on it or scallions on it, Though it really promotes the healthy bacteria to grow in your gut. There's more bacteria cells growing in your gut than there are cells in the whole rest of your body. Actually, 10 times the amount of bacteria cells in the gut than there is in the whole cells in the rest of your body. And those cells produce nutrients and have an func important function. And if you're eating the wrong foods, the sweets and meats diet, then you produce all these bacteria that have pro-inflammatory effects and have weight-gaining effects. When you eat the, the raw vegetables, and the onions, then you have the beneficial microbiome and the beneficial bacteria. And the two cooked foods, cooked mushrooms and cooked beans. Because beans are rich in resistant starch that act as a prebiotic to help the growth of healthy bacteria. And the mushrooms also promote the growth of healthy bacteria in the gut. And this combination of four foods thickens the biofilm. And so now when you have your oatmeal, your mango, or your orange in the morning, you have a lower glycemic effect. So the scientists call that the second meal effect. It means that even when you're not eating low glycemic foods, the glycemic load of the meal is lower because you ate those foods that had beneficial effect on your microbiome. So what I'm saying here is we have so much information today that if, if health care was predominantly the science of human nutrition, then we'd wipe out the health, all the health care problems in America. We'd have our health care, you know, the companies would have all this extra money to spend on their employees. Right now, the health care crisis affects every American it increases our taxes, it increases the deficit. Our companies are, are, don't have money to, to expand or to be competitive in the world. We, and the population of workers we have are dummy down because of their bad diet. And, they don't, and, they, and they're also aging faster, and they also can't focus and concentrate. So you have a better, healthier workforce when you feed them healthier as well. And you don't have health care expenses. So we're talking about the effect, the, the human tragic effects on the society, but also the economic effects and the environmental effects. And so I'm saying here that people underestimate, by a hundredfold, tremendously underestimate the power nutri proper nutrition has to solve so many problems in our society. Even in my book, Fast Food Genocide, I discuss the link between not just fast food and processed food and depression, but fast food and processed foods and lowering of intelligence, inability to realize the American dream and to get a good education, and the link between fast food and sugar and candy and processed food, and crime, and drug use, and drug abuse. Right now we have half of our population, or I say the majority of people incarcerated into federal prisons today, are there because of nonviolent 
drug-related offenses. And I'm saying that sugar and candy and fast food are the gateway drug to more serious drug use because they're addicting. They, they, you get dopamine insensitive and it drives you to be wanting to take more st brain stimulating substances and it makes people more prone to violence and crime and drug abuse. So we want to solve the, if we want to solve and help people who, who are living in poverty, food is the answer. They can't get out of poverty when they have fast food restaurants and convenience stores and no access to food because they can't get, reach their genetic potential. And this fast food environment that we've per allowed to perpetuate, to permeate the inner cities, is a form of bigotry to a degree. Even in medical school. In medical school, we learned black Americans, much higher rates of prostate and breast cancer, much higher rates of stroke and diabetes, much higher rates of you know, early, of these serious problems, as if it's due to their skin color. Bull. It's due to the food they're eating. We look at the real studies and break it down. We find that any population, white populations thrust in the same environments have the same high rates of disease. We go back in history and we look at the, the, um, after the Civil War when, the, when black Americans were freed, they had more centenarians, more people living to be 100 years old among the black Americans compared to the white Caucasian Southerners. In other words, because they were, had access to beans and green vegetables then. The Jim Crow laws, the, you know, the, the white supremacy movement, all the violence in the South driving them into northern inner cities, the advent of World War I and World War II and the growth of the fast food industry, making fast food cheap and convenient and the growth of the convenience foods and the junk foods, taking away the opportunity of people to realize the American dream. So what I'm saying here, it's not we're genetically more similar than we ever thought. What makes the primary differences among people isn't their skin color or their heritage or their background. It's the food they're eating. If you want to have the opportunity to do well with your life and do well for your family, it's important to have access to healthy food to realize your genetic potential. Isn't that the like birthright? Isn't that like a birthright of America? Isn't that something that we stand for as Americans? Equal opportunity for all and the opportunity to realize the American dream and have a good, successful, and happy life. And it's so great to be in this country. We have such a most incredible, beautiful country with fertile soils with volcanic soils and, the, and all types of, you know, ability to grow with healthy food here in different climates and different, you know, we have such um, natural ability to sustain ourselves and to be healthy. And we've gone in a wrong direction. The direction we've gone into is processed foods and fake foods and franken foods and drugs, both illegal drugs and legal drugs. And the idea that our medical profession and drugs and the pharmaceutical companies are our savior for all that ails us. You're depressed? Take a drug. Don't eat right. Don't check your nutrient levels. Don't make sure you're eating a healthy diet. You know, you're overweight? Get a gastric bypass or a lap band. Don't learn how to get rid of your food addictions and eat right. You have heart disease? Cut open your chest. Don't eat properly and reverse it. And the worst thing is, is that people don't have informed consent. They're not told these blood pressure medications are linked to cancer. They're not shown, told that people taking calcium channel blockers for 10 years or more are shown to have double the risk of breast cancer after 10 years. Not even discussed. They don't, they don't have informed consent. They're not told that the bypass surgery and angioplasties do not extend lifespan. They do not reduce future risk of future heart attacks. As a matter of fact, they actually make things worse. You put a stent in, you have to be on a clot-busting drug the rest of your life because now you have a foreign body in your heart. And the clot being on a clot-busting drug or a blood thinner the rest of your life increases your risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So now you've taken a person and put them at higher risk. That's fine if that was the only option. And obviously some people having a heart attack have to put a stent in because they would die if they don't open the blood vessel up. But the point is they're not, people aren't told the option. They're not told before the heart attack what to have done. They're not, told if they, they're not told that they didn't have to have these diseases happen to them. They're not told the futility of these interventions and how little, how relatively ineffective they are. So my position is that I think if people had truly informed consent they knew how futile the medical interventions were, how futile cancer treatments were, how futile cardiovascular procedures were, how futile these medications are at really extending lifespan. We'd have many millions of more people more willing and ready to embrace excellent nutrition as a means of protecting themselves. So people deserve to know the facts here. And if you want to imbibe and go, have, be, you know, go out drinking five nights a week, or you want to snort cocaine, or you want to smoke cigarettes, which we know is a carcinogen, you have the right to do that. But at least you're informed properly that you know cigarettes cause lung cancer and heart attacks. If you want to smoke, take that chance, go ahead and do it. 
Nobody forced you to smoke those cigarettes. But it's different with food. Because they're telling you to eat the foods that are bad, that are causing the problem. And nobody's giving you proper warning. And nobody's warning you about the dangers of the drugs. Nobody's telling you how futile, how relatively ineffective they are. How when we use drugs in combination, like we are being used, and many people on multiple medications, how they increase the risk of cancer. They're not told about the side effects. They're not told how relatively little benefit you get, for example, from taking high blood pressure medications and cholesterol and drugs, reducing the risk of future heart attacks by maybe 10%, when you can reach, we can reduce your risk a hundredfold if you just change your diet. And people aren't given that option and told that what, what the relative benefits and risks are. And they deserve to know this. And candy. Can you imagine parents bringing candy and donuts to their kids' soccer games? and baseball games, poisoning their children, destroying the intelligence of their children, and creating cancer in the future of their own children. Who's going to stand up for this, this thing? You know, it takes courage. Because you know how you say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Don't participate. Don't go to a party and participate in imbibing. Bring a healthy dish. Be open. Maybe you'll save a life. Maybe you'll convince somebody. But people, you know, if they don't have self-esteem, they want to fit in and hide. I'm saying don't hide. Be a role model. Take great care of your health and do it openly and object to what other people are doing. We've got every, we need everybody's help here. We need politicians and educators and nurses and, you know, athletes and media people and, and, we need, and regular people. If, every, if the more people we have embracing excellent nutrition, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk and sharing the benefits, we could change society. It's not going to come from the medical profession, who's really a drug dispensing organization, basically. And it's not going to come from the, from the politicians in Washington, because they're affected by the lobbyists and the biggest lobbyists of the food industry and the drug industry. It's not going to, it has to come from the people. It has to come from and the nutritional scientists and the nutritional research is solid, shows solid information, has been distorted by the media. It's, it's, it's like people are they're so confused getting wrong information. So I really you know, hope people study, study this information, become an expert, because we, together we can change the world here. Well, you know, I tell people to start, place to start, is to eat a big salad once a day. Because raw vegetables have been shown in more than 200 studies to have the strongest link with cancer. Actually, green vegetables have shown to be the most powerful foods to reduce heart disease risk. Green vegetables have shown the highest um, response to reduce dementia risk later in life. Green vegetables have shown the highest risk to reduce cancer risk. Because almost any disease, green vegetables show the most power to reverse them, especially raw green vegetables or lightly cooked when you don't overcook them. So we're talking about my mantra is to go home get an index card on your, and write on your refrigerator the marker, the salad is the main dish, and have one big salad at least once a day as a main dish in one of your meals. And cut a, a whole you know, head of lettuce in there, a whole box, and throw in some watercress or arugula chopped finely on top, put some of the onion on top, and then make a healthy salad dressing for it. Not an oil and salt based dressing, but a dressing that includes nuts and seeds, a whole source of whole food fats. We're talking here about tomato sauce with almonds and sunflower seeds, with some balsamic vinegar or fig vinegar mixed together, or maybe some roasted garlic, maybe an orange blended with some ses toasted sesame seeds and some ro and cashews and a squeeze of lemon and maybe some blood orange vinegar. We're talking about making delicious dressings that are healthy for the salad. And you make that dressing on like sun on the weekend and maybe another different dressing on Wednesday night. You make the weekend dressing, eat for three nights, and then make a different dressing on Wednesday night and have that for three nights. The point I'm making is that you don't have to spend the whole time cooking all night long. And it's easy to throw a thing salad together in five minutes. The dressing's already made, a healthy dressing, you put it on there. And on the weekend, make a giant pot of vegetable bean stew or soup or chili. So you get a bean dish with mushrooms and onions in there. Maybe it's a tomato base, maybe it's lentils in there, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is. You make this big pot of soup. What I do in my house, I make this big pot of soup and we put it in the top shelf of the refrigerator hot. We eat it that night and then the next day it's cool. When it's cold the next morning, we take it out and I put it out into, into like 12 different plastic containers so I can take the container to work with me. So now I have the big salad and the bowl of soup and a piece of fruit I grab for work every day and my work lunch is done. Boom, put it in a bag or a, you know, a carrier, just boom, boom, boom. Salad, the soup or the chili or the bean stew and the piece of fruit, my lunch is done. And lunch is the most important meal of the day.
This is not hard to do. Breakfast is easy anyway. You know, what do people have like oatmeal or steel-cut oats with some flax seeds and berries you know, or a drink or a green smoothie and then when you have your big lunch, you want your biggest meal to be your lunch anyway. It's healthiest to eat a lighter dinner and to eat a little earlier and lighter dinner anyway. Mostly have like a cooked vegetable wok or something with a Thai peanut sauce or, a, you know. But the point I'm making here is if you just get breakfast and lunch right, that's more than two-thirds of it. You know, it's more than two-thirds because lunch is supposed to be your biggest meal and dinner is supposed to be your light meal anyway. Can you imagine the transformation that have occurred to America if they just made the salad and soup and just had a healthy breakfast? Just made two meals? We would trans it would, American society would transform themselves. It's a secret, but it's so easy to do. This is not that complicated or hard to do. It's, it's not going to take all your time. There's some effort. Like just driving to a fast food restaurant, pulling up a, a bag of chips or a bag of cookies. But anything in life that gives you tremendous reward and tremendous benefits has some effort associated with it. And you don't feel good about what you're doing if you didn't have to just apply yourself. You have to apply yourself here. You have to learn. You have to know the why. You have to become the nutritional expert, and you have to be able to articulate why you're doing this to other people. You have to under and then you're going to be able to stick with it. Only when you become the expert and you can adequately articulate why you're doing this to other people. And then you do it, and your tastes change. Not right away. It takes months. But your taste gets stronger. Your smell gets stronger. So many people, even their eyesight improves. And they start to enjoy the flavors of natural foods. They don't need the sugary junk anymore. Because you know why? The banana ice cream made with a frozen banana whipped with a little walnuts or a little bit of macadamia nuts with a teaspoon of real vanilla bean powder whipped together is sweet enough. It didn't need any sweetener in it. The banana made it sweet enough. Your taste for sweet gets stronger when you're away from the sweets. Your taste for salt gets stronger when you're away from the salt. Now lettuce and a cashew nut and an avocado and a strawberry has flavor. Plenty of flavor. A tomato has a lot of flavor in it. For most Americans, their taste buds are so deadened from their highly seasoned, sugared, salted, you know, that these foods, strawberries and avocados and cashew nuts and lettuce, has no taste. They've got to smother it. with. It's like a, the, the, straw, the, the lettuce becomes a holder for a, for a fattening salad dressing. They'll take 75 calories of lettuce in a bowl or 50 calories of raw vegetables, and they'll throw on four tablespoons of an oil-based dressing with 120 calories a tablespoon. That's 500 calories of dressing on 50 calories of vegetables. I say, forget the vegetables then. Just drink the dressing straight from the bottle. It's nuts. The dressing has to be healthy. But I've spent my career developing incredibly delicious recipes that makes a nutritarian diet more tasty and more favorable than the conventional American diet. And that study I mentioned earlier, published in 2012 issue of Nutrition Journal, where we tested to those 750 people, we found that after a six-month period, people enjoyed this nutritarian diet, diet style more than their prior diet, as much or more than their prior diet did, they did. And they all reported their tastes actually got stronger. And they didn't feel that way at the beginning, of course. It took some time. At the beginning, you've got to do it whether you like it or not. You've got to learn the recipes, know why you're doing it. And the more you eat something, the more you develop a taste for it. And as your taste gets stronger, and as, you, as time goes by, this becomes the way you prefer to eat. So for me, for example, I eat the foods I enjoy eating the most. But the foods I enjoy eating the most happen to be the foods that are really good for me. The goal is to train you, and I want to help train you, so you will enjoy this diet more than any other way you could be eating. But it just also happens to be the, wolf, the diet you most enjoy the most happens to be the diet style that's the most protective and most lifespan promoting, the most anti-aging diet of any way you can eat. So can you marry that together? And the answer is yes. That's the whole point of this. That's why this becomes a no-brainer and it becomes an, you have to be insane to eat conventionally. You have to be insane. And you know what? If you eat conventionally, it makes you insane. You know, I have this joke in my book. It says... You have to be crazy to eat fast food. And then the guy says, well, I qualify because I'm crazy. I'm insane. You know, he has this guy with a straight jacket with his hair sticking out. You know, goes, and they also say, you know, one shark says to the other, why don't we eat humans anymore? The, the big shark says to the baby shark. And the mother says, can't eat humans. They're too polluted. Too much mercury and other toxins and poisons in them. 
We've poisoned ourselves to the point of, you know, where, to the point where it's damaging our DNA. And the fast food genocide means that we're seeing more autism, more birth defects, and more childhood cancer, and more learning disabilities in our offspring as a result of foods that we're eating. And that's, mag that's growing at a, at a rap more rapid rate, and it's being magnified into future generations. We're destroying the genetic structure of our future of the human species with these, with these Franken foods, not just your own health, You know, what's amazing is that Americans are the most overweight population in the history of the human race, eating so many more calories than people require, and eating so much more oil and sweets and sugar than you could, you know, it's funny because I say, you know, the stomach is only a liter, the size of a little over a quart. If you're eating natural foods, like fruits and vegetables and nuts and things, you can't put that many calories in your stomach. It gets filled up with fiber and you get full too fast. If you lived on a desert island, or if you went one of these naked in the wood things, you know, and I'd love to do that, but I wouldn't want to have be barefoot. I wouldn't want to stick on those thorns and stuff. I want to have, I could be naked, but I have to have shoes on. But anyway, the point is, you couldn't be overweight. No overweight people. It takes effort to climb the trees and to cut out the pith of the thing and to look for food and to harvest the foods around and to even to kill small animals, whatever you is, but, but you know, rat, lizards and insects and stuff and snakes you could eat and frogs, whatever it is. The point is, is that people can't be overweight living on a natural food diet. It's impossible. It's only the processed foods that can concentrate the calories. And you can't get that much, how much the fruit is bulky and high water content and fiber. So natural fruits grown in the wild aren't even that sweet as the ones that we processed, we use today. You know, so the point I'm making is that primitive people didn't have any kind of free sugar. The sugar was all bound to fiber and digested slowly. Now we have a huge amount of free sugar. By free sugar, I mean it's like sugar without nutrients and fiber associated with it. People are consuming 30 teaspoons of sugar a day. When our, when we, we, we consuming a few, maybe we'd be consuming like you know, 30 to 40 grams of sugar. Now we're consuming 400 grams of sugar, or 4, 000, you know, 400 grams of sugar a day. It's ridiculous what people are eating today. And the point here is, and I know this from many years of study and contemplation, because you can't be that, that skipper never really lived on that island. Get it? Even the American Heart Association recommends people not have free sugar. They tell you not to have more than 25 grams a day of sugar, and that's about 100 calories. But that's still junk food. Why should you have 100 calories of junk food? Of course, they want to be, you know, do what society is doing. If society is taking in hundreds of, cal hundreds of calories, hundreds and hundreds of calories. I mean, one soda from a fast food restaurant, more than 200 grams. People just pouring that sugar right down their throat. I can't, to me, I can't fathom how people could take ke a chemicalized, sugarized me mix with chemicals and artificial flavorings and colorings and sugar and just pour it down their throat. I mean, don't people really understand that they are what they put in their body? It reminds me of my daughter who's now, I have three daughters, but one of my daughters when she was four years old, now she's 23, that daughter, I took her to a health club where she was working out. She was doing like a baby, you know, a little kid workout, you know, class or something. And she came out of the little kid workout class called um, boot camp. She called it boo boo camp. It was called boot camp or something. And she said to me, don't these parents love their children? I said, what are you talking about? Of course they love their children. Of course, we all love our children. What are you talking about? And she said, um, this is a four-year-old. She said, they're feeding them foods that are going to hurt them. They're feeding them junk food. They're feeding them the kid. They're bringing into the parents and bringing to the kids chips and candy in the, in the class to hurt, their, to hurt them. And I said, um, they don't know it's going to hurt them like we know that. They're not doing it on purpose. They don't know it. So she says, how could they be so stupid? How could they not know that you, what you eat doesn't make your body? How do they know that you put things in your mouth that doesn't make what you who you are? This is a four-year-old, right? And so the point I'm making is it's so basic, even a four-year-old understands it, that you become, you are what you put into your body. You become the person that you put into your body. And how are parents so ignorant? So I explained it to her. I say, it's not really that they're so, so she said to me, how could they be so stupid? Then my answer that they, she, so I said to her, it's not that they're so stupid. I said, everybody does it, so people don't think. If you woke up in the morning and you walked to the bus stop to get on the, to the, go to school, if every kid on the, on the playground was smoking a cigarette, and every parent was smoking a cigarette, every mother saying goodbye on the porch was smoking a cigarette, and some countries, you know, around the world, everybody smokes, even kids smoke. 
You think it's normal. You don't even think about it because everybody does it. Well, in this country, it's insanity. Everybody destroy, hurts their children's health and creates cancer in their children by feeding them junk food, and they don't even know about it because they think it's okay because everybody's doing it. It's like social peer pressure, negative social peer pressure. But if very few people did it, they, they try to they'd see it as being abnormal. But it's, what's funny is in this country is that us, who, us, meaning my family, who are eating you know, um, a kiwi, giving you a kiwi and some carrot sticks or a broccoli. My daughter, it's funny, when my daughter was in preschool, she used to take a, fro a box of frozen broccoli to school with her. She would eat the whole 10-ounce box of frozen broccoli for at four years old, you know, and I like it because you like what you're used to eating. And the point I'm making, of course, is that that scene is being abnormal. That scene, having your kid eat broccoli is abnormal. Your kid's eating broccoli? Wow! As if that's something special or abnormal. It's funny, I remember when my son Sean was, in, was about four years old, he went to see his older sisters perform in a, in a school choir. They, the school was putting on this song thing, you know, singing songs that they're like fourth grade or whatever, I don't know what it was. So he's coming in with his parents and there's, a, there's chocolate chip cookies on a table right at his nose height. And they're handing out chocolate chip, chocolate chip cookies to the kids as they walk in the door. So they hand him a cookie and my wife and I are looking at him and we're going, I wonder what he's going to do. He's never seen a chocolate chip cookie before. You know? Let's just see this as a scientific experiment, see what he does with the cookie, you know? So he takes it, and he smells it, and he takes a little nibble of it, and he goes, ooh, that's junk food, and he throws it back at the person on the table. You know, what I'm saying now is that these kids don't even like things that are that sweet, because they're too, they're too heavily flavored and sweet for them. They like their desserts. They like their ice cream and their cookies and their things made without all this heavy sugar because they, their taste buds would be overwhelmed by those foods. And they like what they're used to eating. My kids used to always bring people from the neighborhood over, their friends over, to have our smoothies and our desserts because they thought they were so great and so much better. And the other kids liked them too. They would say, how come you can't teach, can you teach my parents how to make some of this stuff? But my kids loved this stuff. You know, they loved it and they were excited about this stuff. And they appreciated it. They weren't deprived, if anything, they felt that they were very special to have this kind of food, delicious food that was tasted great and also was healthy for them. They felt proud of it. See, it's very important when you use studies that you know which studies to give more credence to and which studies hold the most valuable information. Because let me say it right here, that for a study to be really definitive, it has to have thousands of participants. It has to go on for decades. And it has to use hard endpoints, like death or cancer or cardiovascular disease, or, or heart attacks or, or cancer deaths. You know. So we're talking here about three, three criteria. Thousands of participants, many years of study going on for decades, and using hard endpoints. A soft endpoint would be like your blood pressure went down, you lost some weight, or your cholesterol dropped. And we can give people a diet of just Twinkies. And they'll get sick of eating Twinkies. They'll reduce their calorie count and they might, they might lose some weight. So, so we, people could almost use any study, like the, eggs, the egg people do. They try to take a diet that's really bad and it already is full of saturated fat and full of all kinds of junk and they add an egg to it. It doesn't get worse. The egg doesn't make people worse. Take the, because the diet's already so bad, once you're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, adding two, two and a half packs isn't going to make things any worse. We're already smoking two packs a day. The point is when your diet, if you, if, so it's not adding the egg, but if you, or you substitute, they do with other studies with saturated fat, they take the saturated fat, like the cheese or the butter out, and they put in more refined carbohydrates like sugar or white bread, and they show there's no benefit. Well, they're all bad stuff. White bread and sugar are just as bad as saturated fat. Not a question is, if you took the saturated fat and put beans or broccoli in there, you'd see benefit. But of course, if you put in pasta and bread in there or sugar, you're not going to see any difference. You may even see it get things worse because some people are more sugar sensitive, you know, more, more glycemically sensitive. The point I'm making is you can sh these studies can be used to confuse the public and trick them. Where they're not getting tricked are these long-term studies like this we're talking about now, like a study that went on with more than 40,000 women, and they've actually about 44,000 women, and they tracked them over a 20-year period. 44,000 women, and they tracked how many animal products they ate. And they gave each person a score on 1 to 20. The 1 would be a, like a mostly a vegan diet, and the 20 would be most like an Atkins type, paleo, where they're you know, a ketogenic diet, with eating mostly animal products with very little carbohydrate in their diet. And everything else, everybody else scored from you know, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, from between 1 and 20, based on what percentage of their, pro their diet was plant material versus animal products in the score. And they found that 
Over this 20 year period, there was a large number of deaths and a large number of heart attacks. And they could predict the amount of cardiovascular deaths by the animal product percentage in the person's diet. And that the people who scored above 16 had 60% increased risk of cardiovascular death compared to the group scoring below six, for example. The point I'm making here, it's not just one study with many people. There was another study with more than 120,000 participants, which followed people for 24 years and looked at cardiovascular death, a Swedish study that followed that people, and they showed the same thing was true, that the, that the two things were at, at primary effect. More animal products increased cardiovascular death, and more refined carbohydrates increased cardiovascular death, and more fruits and vegetables and beans, more natural produce or plants decreased death. And there's a huge difference between, those, between all those parameters. We're talking about dividing food into three categories. Produce, natural whole foods, processed foods, and animal products. And to be healthy, we have to greatly expand the produce component and greatly collapse and reduce the animal product and processed food component. But what the paleo diet or the Atkins diet or the, these popular meat-based diets do is they show people studies on the negative effect of processed foods and high glycemic carbohydrates. And by inference, they make it seem like it's okay to eat more animal products instead of those foods. They're not fair. It's not, it's not just sloppy science. It's irresponsible. It's dangerous. It's malpractice. Because right now, there's no controversy. We know from these long-term studies that earn credence to the large numbers of people that any diet style rich in animal products is shortening the lifespan, and particularly shortening it for cancer as well, not just cardiovascular disease. A recent study published in 2014 followed 6,000 people for 18 years. In the 50 to 65-year-old ca year category, if, they follow, if they're in the 50 to 65-year-old category, age range, and they follow them for 18 years, let's say they're 60, now they're 78. Right? They're 50, so, between 50, so between 50 and 60, they followed for 18 years. And they found that those people eating more animal products had four times the amount of cancer compared to those eating less animal products. And, the, and they classified those in the high animal product category as those eating more than 30% of calories from animal products, like Americans do. Americans already eat a third of their diet from animal products. And those in the low category, they counted below 10%. And then they had the moderate, the middle, and the middle, but then they saw that in each category, cancer deaths went up accordingly. Overall mortality and overall death more than doubled in the high category of animal products. By worldwide standards, the amount of animal products eaten in America is considered a very large amount by worldwide standard. In South Korea, for example, in 1988, they were only eating 6.4% of calories from animal products. And they had one-eighth the amount of breast cancer. And then over the subsequent 20 years, because of the influence of America, they're now eating 16% of calories from animal products, and their breast cancer rates went up eightfold. The breast cancer rates went up 800%, right, or 700% as the, over that, you know, with time because they've adapted more American ways. We're the perfect, we're the example. I always say the American diet with this 33% of calories from animal products with almost 60% from processed foods, is the, uh, I say you can't design a better diet to create cancer and heart disease. That's why I say this diet must be designed by ISIS to kill us, right? And, the, and, and how you can really kill people, if you want to, is by mixing the high glycemic carbohydrates with the animal products, with especially, you know, the processed meats, the red meats, the barbecued meats, the grilled meats. Fast food meats are grilled, barbecued, flame broiled, fried. More damage because you're cooking, the, not, not cooking the food in a, a soup, not boiling it. You're cooking it under high heat, causing you know, heterocyclic amines and nitrosamino compounds that cause cancer in the way the food's prepared as well. But when you have a hamburger with the white bread and the meat and spaghetti being meatballs with the white flour and the beef and you have the, the ham and cheese and the pizza and the white flour and the cheese, we're mixing the high glycemic carbohydrate with the high animal product that the, raises those unfavorable hormones we're talking about. Both insulin and insulin-like growth factor one or IGF-1 then we're really promoting a huge amount of needless suffering and cancer in this country. So, you know, I'm making it easy for people. I'm trying to make it taste delicious. And I'm also running studies. I'm the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. I'm running studies for people who are utilizing this dietary portfolio, including all these anti-cancer foods in their diet. And I have this acronym. The acronym is G-BOMBS. 
G-B-O-M-B-S, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Right? I'm not saying your diet should be all those six foods. I'm not saying it's all you eat. But I'm saying make a conscious effort to, remem to memorize that list and try to eat them every day if you can. Right? Did you eat your greens today? Did you eat your mushrooms today? Have a checklist. I ate my greens. I ate my mushrooms. I ate my flax seeds or chia seeds. I had some onions or scallions today. I had a big portion of green vegetables. I had some berries today. I had some wild blueberries, frozen wild blueberries in my oatmeal in the morning. Yeah, I, had, I didn't have my blueberries today. Oh, I maybe should put blueberries tonight with my dinner then. Or maybe I'll have some pomegranates or, or cherries then to make up for the blueberries. In other words, the point is, make your checklist in your head. Because these foods, these G-bombs, have been shown in scientific studies to have tremendously, tremendous power to protect against cancer. Each one of these foods individually has medical studies that support its efficacy in preventing cancer. Take the lignans in seeds, for example, in flax seeds, chia seeds, that's those lignans. Studies show it's a 10-year study done in women who have a diagnosis of breast cancer, followed for 10 years. Those who had some small amount of lignin in their diet compared to no lignin had a 71% decreased risk of death for breast cancer over that 10-year period. They already had cancer. Right? It's going to be less effective once you have cancer. You start early in life, it's going to be much more effective. But look how effective it was even when the person had cancer, when you expect to be no effectiveness. And you know how many lignans they were consuming on the average? A third of a milligram. A teaspoon of ground flax seeds has seven milligrams. They were having 1 20th of that, and they still showed a 71% reduction in cancer. What if they had a tablespoon a day, what they're supposed to be having, and what they were supposed to be taking it before they started to get before they got a diagnosis of cancer? Would have been even more protective. But you know what? But what if they didn't just have the flax seeds? What if they had the full G-bombs in their diet? Because each one of these foods individually has been shown to protect against cancer by like 60 to 70%. Took the onions. Onions protect but between 50 and 88% regular use of onion in almost, uh, in almost every different cancer it protects against. Green vegetables, green cruciferous vegetables we're talking about, right? Beans have pretentious effects against cancer. They're full of inositol penticus phosphate and other polyphenols that protect against cancer. You know the dark red and black color of beans? Those are particularly cancer-fighting foods. Women who eat beans regularly have a 50% low risk of, of um, breast cancer. Beans are linked to longer long, to longevity in all the blue zones of the world where people have the most centenarians, where people are bean-eating pop populations. All populations, less meat, more vegetables and beans. The point I'm making right now is that the GBOM acronym is something you should be aware of and be consuming those foods on a daily basis that will save your life. And if you're interested, go to nutritionalresearch.org. And if you're a woman who wants to join our study, where we've recruited over 2,000 women so far who are pledging to eat G-bombs every day and have, their, have their, history, their medical history recorded for our study to be part of this study. And we're trying to recruit a total of 10,000, looking for more women to join. So if you're interested, go to nutritionalresearch.org and, and click on the link that says Nutritarian Women's Health Study. It's run out of my Nutritarian Research Office at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. But because we do this through the internet and everything, you know, so we don't have to live in flag in Arizona to be part of the study. Any person residing in the United States can be part of the study. Any adult woman living in the United States. Why we're not doing men is because we're starting with women because obviously we don't, it's limited by, recent, by economic resources. Eventually we'll probably we'll do a man, men's study as well. In my 25 years of practice, I've seen many people with early stage breast cancer reverse their disease or or do well. I've seen many people, the most with prostate cancer, many men with prostate cancer, because you can follow their PSAs and their free PSAs and see they go down and, dis and get better. So many men with a diagnosis of prostate cancer have come to me and seen their disease reverse itself by following this nutritarian diet, this protocol that protects against cancer. I've even seen people with advanced cancers after having chemotherapy or breast reduction. I've, you know, I, I've seen people now that have been surviving and doing well for 10, 15, and 20 years. You know, I've seen one woman, for example, um, we know it's, it's not likely she had ovarian cancer that metastasized to her lung, four liters of fluid in her lung with a collapsed lung, had the fluid extracted, um, given six months to live. Chemotherapy may have helped somewhat, but now she's selling out 17 years later. She's in great health. The chance of her living 17 years later after that metastatic ovarian cancer, very, very slim. We know that this the dietary, uh, this nutritional excellence certainly helped her odds in succeeding this. So we are, we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg. We don't really know for sure with enough numbers of people, but we know that this helps people. And the studies do show that the same diet that's protective against cancer 
does help survival and prevent recurrence in people who have a diagnosis of cancer. So, you know, so health care, proper health care, this is not alternative medicine. This is where medicine should have gone. This is progressive medicine. This is correct medicine. This is where healthcare should be today. So it's almost insulting to call it an alternative. It's like we're giving people some like magic pills, because of course the alternative medicine movement so much is looking for gimmicks and tricks too, and have a remedy mentality. We'll give you this remedy that we're gonna we'll give you this herbal product that'll get away your headaches or lower your blood pressure. It's the same thing, the same problem. We're not looking for a, I can give you a, sub, a natural substance to make you feel put you to sleep or to wake you up or to lower your blood pressure or raise your blood pressure, make your heartbeat slower, make your heartbeat faster. But we're still, the medicinal effect is, is the pharmacological effect is due to the toxicity of the natural substance. We're, not, we're looking to live in a manner to avoid the need for medicinal substances because we've earned good health. We're not trying to cover things up by using medicines. We're trying to earn good health so we don't need health care, an emergency, of course, but we don't need much health care. We don't need much doctoring. We don't need much alternative care. We don't need any kind of care. We're naturally healthy. We can save our money and we can have fun with it, not spend it on health care.